In fantasy media, there's often a variety of homes, villages, farmland, castles, or desolation that makes up the themes and visual impact of an area. If I show you four different pictures, your brain immediately comes up with a visual history about these worlds. This happens even if you don't specifically know where it is from. The complexity or simplicity of these buildings helps create this, along with the terrain and vegetation, or lack thereof. In MMORPGs, there are beautiful areas that create similar feelings. Many older MMOs don't really allow players to personalize buildings, and some didn't even let players enter most buildings. Thankfully, more modern games are closing this gap each year, but I think there's something that still needs to be addressed, and that is a mechanic that facilitates role-playing with social and visual contrast, where the options for support and conflict within a community can create their own lore over time by the choices they make socially and personally in a way that will represent a player's headcanon more accurately to support role-playing immersion for their characters. Also, having a housing system that feels more ingrained in the world instead of a sectioned off instance, like in some survival MMOs, but in a way that offers more sustainability and balance in an RPG genre. In MMORPGs currently, you have your different races and classes. Some are like your warriors and paladins, and others are like your elves and druids. When we see concept art for these characters, there are often common ideas that some are settlers that live in towns with buildings, and others live surrounded by more nature-based environments. Or some are wanderers who have no set home. It really depends on the character and how players want to mix or match these themes, but it's something players think about when creating a character. However, in current MMORPGs, everyone exists the same way. They fight monsters. The only difference is how they fight monsters and their outfits. In Spirit Relics, our goal is to create a role-playing environment where your player has more dimension than just killing monsters. One facet that plays into this is the building mechanics. Creating different building mechanics will ground the characters into settlements, or the wilderness, or a mix of the two, with traveling having more meaning and depth to it. History will represent itself in the world visually through player actions if they work alone, together, or against each other. Different location aesthetics using structures, fauna, and terrain in each location will create different in-game cultures on top of this experience. This is our main topic for today, and I'm here to explain how this is possible in the MMORPG genre using my own game design spirit relics as an example. Just as a reminder, these are ideas that anyone can take or use in their own games. Now, let's get started with the concepts. Each region has their own fauna, flora, and material themes. For example, a forest-themed region would have a ton of trees and wouldn't have as much stone or ores. A rocky-themed region would be the opposite, where it would have plenty of stones and ore, but not a lot of trees. It would be ideal for regions to have a further split of materials, maybe like a north and south, where the north has special geodes and the south has crystals, or east and west, where each has different trees. Aesthetically, these resources will be visually different from each other and offer variances in crafting aesthetics and stats to support distinct areas. For example, maybe crafts from a stone-based area are slower, but have more defense. A wooden-based area is faster, but has less defense. This could extend to local areas' monsters as well. Going forward, I'll call the overall umbrella-themed area a region, and the separated resource sections within it as territories. If you're a smaller studio, I recommend just using regions, and if you're a larger studio, adding territory subsections within your regions will add much more flavor and variety to your game. In either case, the visual and stat separations will support players that start in these areas to feel like they're part of a community, as it provides a contrast visually and mechanically to other communities. It also adds weight to their choice of starting point on a server map. As the game grows, these areas can have more unique visuals and stat properties, like a swampy, glowing mushroom-themed area or a lava river volcanic one. But the importance and sustained feeling of choice is only really possible where traveling is challenging in a way that is still engaging, but offers a sort of barrier of entry when it comes to gathering resources outside of a player's starting region. While we will cover monster threats in the next episode, I do want to discuss this portion a bit, because if traveling is dangerous, it adds more weight to building and maintaining a player's safe point. 
So each region will need enough resources to mostly sustain itself, while providing some sort of a challenge that would encourage the concept of overcoming that traveling barrier to make their local challenges easier. It could be that a monster in their starting area is critically weaker to a poison that's in a foreign land. However, once in foreign lands, the player will find their hometown items weaker in these new monster encounters. Players could choose to collect more resources in this new area to be even more formidable once they return to their hometown if they can survive. Or they can sprint back to their local area with the one resource they originally set out for. Or maybe they can set the new location as their new home, through personal choice or if they have a hard time escaping, and slowly craft and quest up to better equipment to live there permanently or to eventually escape back home. Or players could avoid traveling altogether and continue sticking to their region, as it may just be an aesthetic they're fond of, or by honing their specialties within that region, they could find clever ways to work around or defeat challenges in a way that is unique to their area. For example, players can craft more in their starting region and create large powerful traps that could offset the need to travel outside of your land. Since large items cannot fit in your inventory, it's easier to create and maintain traps, barriers, and other structures like forts near your home or in a group settlement. Or, weapon and armor crafts can become good enough to match or exceed the need to travel due to the time spent focusing on and mastering local attacks and challenges and befriending NPCs that live in your area. However, combining these methods and stacking the benefits would result in the strongest method. For example, these large traps could be coded with the prior example of a foreign poison. This would support the idea for town and city structures that feed into a variety of player interests for the betterment of their society if done successfully. Thus, a town or city's cohesion will show their overall strength and efficiency between players staying and players traveling or players that do a mix of everything. Solo players will feel the effect directly if they can do this alone or with hired NPC help. They can be as self-sustaining as they want and utilize what they deem necessary with the resources they collect using their own resourcefulness and power and thus creating their own legends. And so, with all these examples, players can decide what interests them more. It's important to make sure that all of these options exist so players can choose their options and thus create their own character stories, and ultimately their own lore if they make these choices alone or with others. Now that region, territory, and traveling mechanics are out of the way, we need to talk about specific building mechanics. To do that, first we'll talk about building recipes. In every starting point, players will start with a temporary shelter recipe. This is just a small building structure that can serve as the player's safe point. We'll talk more about protection features soon. Note that a player doesn't have to pick up an item to discover it, just examine, click on it, or otherwise interact with it. And after building one structure and knowing all the materials needed to make the next building, players will unlock new building recipes. Players traveling across regions will retain their original recipes they've unlocked as they have built. They'll still need their hometown resources to create the same buildings in foreign land. We'll cover trading routes in the future, but know that players can set resources on wagons to transfer large amounts of goods that won't typically fit in their inventory. So players can still build their original recipes on foreign land, but with more work. This adds a visual cue if you start seeing foreign buildings in your hometown. Could they be creating new trading outposts, or is something else their intention? Spirit Relics will have ways to direct player experience, for example in PvE or PvP game modes, but we'll have to talk about these specifics in future episodes. In this episode, we're going to discuss the general role-playing goal, and hopefully we'll be able to make the specifics clearer as you follow along. When players discover new resources in foreign land, they start to learn new recipes. They again start with a temporary shelter, but can use these new materials to create it this time, and they have to build up to unlock more building recipes as they did before. The new territory's aesthetics will have a similar architecture style as their original region, even if they are using the new location's materials. 
So in this instance, the player that moved locations but utilizes the land's resources will still have a different building style than the natives who chose this as their spawning or starting point. See how the visuals are contributing to a player history here. Locals will know who is local and foreign at a glance, whether they are players that are utilizing the land or players who appear to be invading the land with foreign resources. Later episodes, we'll discuss how players can truly exchange building recipes. This way, characters can get fully integrated into a new society from other players or NPCs that allow it. If territories are included in the game design, when adding new locations, the building assets needed to be created by developers would be exponential, as each territory would need to make their own set of local and foreign building styles. So if on a budget, publishers can opt to have local territory recipes, but then foreigners can all have the same foreign recipes. For example, if two characters from a rocky region and a forest region enter a desert region, they both would have the same temporary shelter, cabin, house, etc. But a local desert player would have a unique desert style of temporary shelter, cabin, house, etc. There are many ways to figure out how to manage asset creation limitations and scope in the design, and that's one way to do it. Another way is to keep the differences in buildings, but only have three different building types, a shelter, a shack, and a home, for example. Just as long as the base design of the game will have locals with their own building aesthetics and foreigners having something different. I believe this still has the potential to resonate with role-playing players because the buildings themselves suggest a player history at first glance for all travelers, locals, foreigners, and invaders. With the understanding for foreign and local crafting out of the way and building recipes, we're finally about to discuss the construction mechanics. And of course, many people might wonder what kind of building mechanics would spirit relics have? There are many types of building mechanics in games, like block by block, sectional, building block segments, whole buildings, and more, each having their pros and cons. In Spirit Relics, I've decided on a system where for smaller structures, players can place whole buildings, like different sized tents and huts, and these would be animated in few segments during construction for medium structures, or all at once if there are small structures like tents. Later on, players can unlock the ability to make customizable buildings, where while making a building, they can drag and drop squares to make the structure with different options for windows, doors, roofs, walls, flooring, etc. These will be saved as tradable blueprints that allow players to build them in the world quickly if they have the right and enough resources. So they don't have to continue building them from scratch each time if they plan on placing the same structure over and over again. This will ensure that players will later on have more creative freedom, but in a way that still fits the world visually, since they will be themed in a way that won't break immersion too much. Since Spirit Relics is themed to be sort of a medieval fantasy, limitations are needed to keep construction thematically in place. Once you are ready to start construction, the best way to get started is with a campfire. A campfire creates a means to cook food and is a mild repellent to monsters wandering in the wild. All players are equipped with the ability to cast a single protection spell. You can use this on a campfire. This is used to indicate a private property. A protected private property will keep other players from picking up items, destroying or moving your furniture and buildings, and also keep them from placing their own buildings, items, and furniture in your property. When casting a protection spell, your hand will glow, and a magic circle will appear under the campfire you are casting to. If someone already owns the fire, your magic circle will shatter. If no one owns it, upon casting success, the seal will create a golden glow inside the fire that only the creator will see when interacting with this campfire or walking near it. You have now created a protected property. This visual indicator may change as we adjust the concepts, but a visual indicator will be needed for clarity to make your protected campfire distinct from other campfires. This is a great area to start collecting things like logs, stone, or other resources without the fear of items being taken or disappearing over time. So if you accidentally drop an item while you're organizing or want to display items you've collected, you'll have no fear of a player just grabbing them or it timing out in the world. 
You just need to make sure that your fire stays lit or else you lose your protected status. These areas just return to normal open world zones where players can pick up dropped items, items can disappear over time, and so forth. Your fire can stay lit while you're offline. You can craft things like self-feeding campfires, set coals, or do other crafts that can strategically keep your campfire on for longer. So if you need a break from the game, just be strategic about it, much like how someone would prepare for winter. Furthermore, anything planted in your area will, by default, not be harvestable by other players, so you could plant trees on your property. This is a quick way to get more logs if you can maintain their growth, harvest, and replanting cycles. But the need to keep fire lit will create a need for players to maintain the forestry around them, or at least on their own property, which will be important for when we talk about more nature-based characters later on. You can also let a friend or the community know you'll be away and other people can still notice and help. Strangers and friends can help stoke the fire if they have access to it, so communities can be relied on if you've made connections, or if a kind stranger happens to find your solo secluded area. Again, if they have access to that fire. Items, furniture, and buildings in a protected status will still decay, but much slower than usual. The concept of building decay will not only help clear the world of abandoned properties as long-term inactivity starts occurring, it also creates visual aids for what's actually happening in the game's history. Your structure will not collapse in an active protected state. They'll just gain cracks, cobwebs, and small infestations. All items will retain their basic functions even if you abandon it for a long time if you strategized well. Don't worry, some logs or stones or common materials in your starting location will be enough to quickly repair things like cracks in your structures. Thus, some towns will be vibrant and clean, and some may be a mix, like when there's an abandoned district within a town that no one likes to go to. Or maybe the settlement got themselves into a dire situation. Some areas will still look like decayed buildings, while others, depending on the situation or how much time has passed, can look more like scrap materials or ruins before it fully disappears. This will open the land to new players and new experiences, thus allowing history to become history and long-term structures to have a sense of awe for remaining relevant to players to maintain it. This could also allow players to create things like museums as they collect and archive ancient items and relics. When buildings and furniture start decaying or get destroyed, they drop some of the original resources used to build it. If there's still some structure standing, players can further dismantle these to get a chance for more resources. So players can build off of ruined areas, or they can leave it for nature to reclaim if they don't need or want the resources. A player returning from being logged off for a very long time will still have their recipes and templates and can build again upon returning with the right resources or players can log on very casually to quickly repair buildings that need to be maintained. Players can still build outside of a protected property, but unprotected properties will be treated like regular open world areas. Since players have one protection spell, it will be up to players to create things like durable walls, gates, or castles that will need to be maintained and guarded if they want to grow outside of their allotted area. So it will be a challenge to create and maintain large imposing areas, but not impossible for organized groups to do. Unprotected properties will need more maintenance than protected ones and will be less resistant to monsters, but the amount depends on the materials used. For example, an unprotected iron fortress will still be stronger than an unprotected wooden one, but it might take more effort to maintain a reserve of iron if the location or trade routes aren't strategized. Players can have stockpiles in their protected properties or in guarded but unprotected storages outside or within buildings or fortress walls. It's up to players on how they want to manage their resources. For example, players can even make agreements to have their protection spells be used for the betterment of their society, where NPCs or players can guard their homes, but they'll use their protection spells on storages or parts of a large castle that encompasses everyone's property. There will also be combined systems to make sure that players aren't able to spam placed furniture in the open world, all in a way that is mostly reflected in the world's mechanical lore but we'll cover that later on. Where your protection spell is casted is where your property hub will be. 
A property hub is where you can set your settings on your property, set a resurrection point, and more. When you build more mantles, fireplaces, or other fire sources, you can add more access points for your hub. This helps players access their hubs from multiple floors in their home, fort, or castle, while still having one protection spell. They can also transfer and remove hubs, as long as you always have at least one. Trying to remove your last one, the UI will ask you if you're sure you want to do this, since removing all hubs, and thus your protection spells, will make your property unprotected. Now that you know about property hubs, your property size starts small. Building a larger building that you've unlocked on your property will expand your property size if the surrounding area is available. If it's unavailable, for example, maybe in a crowded village, town, or city you insist on living in, when space is cleared through inactivity, wars, or monsters, or the owner moves, you can attempt to expand it from your property hub again later. The first to expand into it will take it. This is counted in tile spaces. So if you're still not at max size, even if you're missing a single tile, you can attempt it again at any time at your property hub, as long as you still have your building in good health on your property. There is a max size. You can also edit the shape of your protected area through your property hub. For example, you may want your property set as a circle, oval, a square, or a rectangle. To keep your building fully protected, you will need to place all parts of it within your property. Sections jutting out of it will be unprotected, and thus subject to decay or tax. Areas on your property cannot typically be attacked. In the case of damages made to your property, by default, other players can help you do repairs, just as they can help you stoke your campfire. You can change this setting from your property hub if you don't want help, and you can also change your defaults in your game settings if you want as well. Other players can enter open areas and player properties. In these instances, they can sit on furniture, use a campfire to cook as long as they aren't placing furniture, and can also log off at these public campfires. You can think of an open area as a public area. Some visual examples of an open area could be a porch with an entryway, a farm with accented fences that don't circle the entirety of the field, and a walled area with an open gate and an open front building. But if you don't want strangers wandering in, you'll want to close off your protected areas. Fences and walled areas, as long as the entryways are closed, will be considered a closed off area and thus is not considered public. An entry will be protected if the outer area is not damaged. For example, if a farming plot is made with a fence that circles the entire plot, players who try to jump over the fences when the gate is closed will be met with a magic barrier so they can't enter. Visual examples of closed off areas would be anything that fully encompasses an area like a fence or a wall even if it doesn't have a closed roof. If a fence or a wall is damaged enough by monsters, it might become an open area until repaired. At your property hub, you can set allowed players like friends and parties to have the ability to enter your closed off property or set it as public and anyone can enter. In the case of multi-roomed buildings, you can set different closed off areas as public or private. This is useful if storekeepers, smiths, or restaurant owners want a public area for business but want closed off areas for storage or their living quarters or both. Allowed players can open gates, doors, and other entryways to enter an otherwise private property. Leaving doors open will still be blocked off with magical barriers in the case of banned or otherwise not allowed players set by your property hub. If you remove entry permissions from a player or players while they are inside, they will turn into a firefly and be teleported outside of the closed property, but can still move about in any public area. You can edit permissions of players logged off in your private property from your property hub as well. There will be built-in rules that will limit some placement of building and furniture. For example, every door will require a certain amount of free space in front of it to keep players from being trapped. There will be more things we need to keep in mind for the system, since it's in an open world and not in an instance, and I've written these down, but I'd rather have the game set these systems and not talk too much about it. Just know that it's based on logic to not trap or grief players while making it still as flexible as possible. 
Buildings can be used to house players, NPCs, and can be used to create special storages and functions to make building and crafting easier. We'll talk about these details and more in future episodes. Some of these topics will cover settlements, trade routes, and crime in a way that can still maintain a thriving town or city without victims of crime losing their progress in a unique yet functional way. This will further develop player history and lore based on player interactions with each other. But with what you currently know, with these current building mechanics, solo players or small groups of people, or maybe even large groups of people, can build alone or together using these mechanics. These mechanics cover a ton of different usages and is already setting the stage for what kind of worlds spirit relics could have for settler-based characters. Now let's talk about the contrasting society type, the nomads. While the settlers are characters who prefer stability and collection of resources, nomads are characters who want to see the healthy growth and harvest of nature for fauna, flora, and raw materials alike. We're going to integrate the logging in and out features we discussed in the last episode, including mantles. So if you need more context, the link will be in the description. Since nomads are thematically linked to nature, they need a protected fauna partner to cast special nature-based spells. To set a protection spell on a fauna, you'll essentially need a means to keep a protected campfire on the fauna. While nomads can also make regular campfires and mantles, they have the ability to craft special ones that are compatible with fauna. If not bonded or tamed, the fauna won't let you set it on them. They will also know if you have an active protection spell or recently broke a bond and will buck or shake it off. Since players can only have one protection spell, you can't set a protection spell on a creature and have protected property. In some instances, especially in more aggressive fauna, they may attack you for your failed attempt. Note that the nomadic system is not the same as riding regular mounts, as riding regularly will be seen and function differently than nomadic living. Nomads are a character archetype, and riding a mount is a traveling function. Just like any player, nomads can still build, and will do well to use their unique nomadic recipes to keep these areas small and unopposing to nature. Because wild fauna will get stressed when inside natureless, settlement areas, in general, wild untamed fauna will avoid settlement areas. Nomadic structures are more integrated into nature, and if done properly, won't unsettle nature's creatures, and they can continue to live among them. Protected fauna is similar to protected property, where other players cannot alter it. Other players cannot damage, tame, or mount this creature. And also, just like buildings, some maintenance is required. Nomads will have to do quite a few things to keep this lifestyle active. The mantle will need to keep burning to keep their fauna protected, just like a campfire, and will need to upkeep their bond or trust and keep them healthy. One way to slowly break a bond is being separated from the partner fauna for too long or staying in settlements for too long. Nomads can evolve their fauna over time and add more wild fauna to their herd or pack. To add more fauna to your herd or pack, they all have to be the same species, which is based on your partner. Herbivores can have more members and omnivores and carnivores are allowed much less. These groups have a max size based on their species. When the herd or pack gets nearly full, the older fauna get statuses that cause them to run slower and fight weaker, making them easier prey. At max size, new members cannot be created and attempts to convince wild leaderless fauna to join you will fail. Some will attack you and cause your herd or pack to scatter temporarily due to stress. Players can also fix their main fauna to have armor and weapons to protect themselves from monster attacks, predators, and other players in PvP and wars. The longer you keep the mantle, bond, herd, and health in good standing, the stronger your fauna get. When on your fauna, you can use it to cast nature-based buffing spells. Spells can be used to manage your herd traits, buff yourself, your hidden property, help you keep track and summon your fauna if separated, calm them when startled, as well as beef up refresh rates of resources like ores and vegetation. In a cluster of flora-like trees, a nomad can cast a spell on part of the area to increase the refresh rate of a resource for some time, or spread a resource. There is a distance requirement between buffed areas, which will encourage nomads to travel to cast another nature buff. 
This will cause nomads to understand the layout of the land. Other nomads can stack buffs next to or on already buffed resources in most cases, so they can work strategically alone or together to determine the best resources to farm from or cause nature overgrowth in desired areas. Casting spells increases and maintains the bond between a character and their fauna. Using a spell causes a cooldown for that spell and the use of a spell slot. Nomads will have limited spell slots with less at first and more over time, eventually hitting max slots. They will also unlock different spells over time. Some nature-based players may want to perpetuate the growth of nature to exponential proportions, but in Spirit Relics, the law of nature seeks a balance between growth and harvest. When large clusters of flora, fauna, and materials occur, disease or weakened states can also occur. While players can temporarily use up a spell slot to help cure it, managing growth in an area can be done strategically to avoid overcrowding of resources, to maximize buff usage instead of wasting it on rot. Nomads can harvest most of their own buffed locations as well. Different terrains will have different ideal max cluster sizes, and nomads can work together to manage rot if overcrowding is desired. Overcrowding flora and materials can also result in monster growth, which could be good or bad depending on the nomad's ability to fight them or manage their way around them. Some might want to keep them in an area to either keep other players away or in player-made agreements through churches. We'll cover a little bit about churches later in this episode. Tributes can be set by nomads to offer settlers or travelers targeted resources that should be collected either due to strategic management of a resource, to make other players harvest, to lessen a cluster size, or for the nomad's personal benefit. When tributes are harvested by settlers, nomads benefit from it. Tributed resources have special stats that can be used for crafting and usage. This makes them desired by settlers. The nomad that casted it gains a special tribute spell slot that has greater power or unique effects than regular spell slots. These spells can be used on relics, equipment, combat, nature-based buildings, spells, and herd or pack management. Tributed flora and materials will gain some sort of visual indicator to help indicate to settlers that it is more desirable than other resources. For now, I've marked these as slightly golden, but it's possible to have different glowing effects, or maybe a nature-based indicator like larger fruit or thicker tree stumps or more reflective crystals. Offering pack and herd members as tribute can also be done, so hunters can get better item stats from fauna like bones or meat. Fauna offered as tribute is worth more than floral tributes, so nomads will get more tribute spell rewards. When a fauna tribute is offered, the fauna will have a golden glowing halo or some other indicator if we come up with something else. Strategically, players can learn how to stack their regular and tribute spells, so players could do something like set a fauna tribute, then make them into solo wanderers to give monsters or hunters more distance between you and them to keep your herd from getting startled. Tributed fauna cannot be added to another nomad's herd even if they're wandering in the wild, since they retain the spell connected to you but they could potentially wander into a wild, untamed herd or pack, and you will still reap the benefits if it is hunted. Tributed fauna can still be hunted by nomads. However, depending on the nomad's herd or pack, nomads will need to be strategic about this. Each fauna has their own law system. A nomad of a deer species should not hunt other deer, or it would drastically hurt their partner's bond. Killing the same exact species will be major damage to bond, and killing attributed same species will drastically stack that distrust. This is determined by if the last hit was the killing blow. Hurting but not killing the same species will also hurt their bond. Another thing that nomads can do is each territory and region will have special nature-based core zones. While we'll talk more about them in the future, core zones affect a region or territory based on its type. Tribute spells from nomads can be used on a core area to give the entire region or territory a longer lasting but smaller buff. Many nomads would have to work together, separately, or in groups to stack the buffs so that the results are more noticeable throughout the region, and often enough to upkeep it if they want to do that. 
Also, it is difficult to get to core areas as they are heavily guarded by fauna and creatures who are connected to the core's power. We will talk more about raids with nomads and settlers in the future. While we will talk about monster threats in another episode, if a monster takes attributed fauna or flora, the monster will gain a temporary buff. These monsters will also have better resource stats when defeated and harvested. However, they may gain temporary new movesets or increase speed or attack. The nomad can attack the monster themselves for more resources, or if left alone, the monster could attack another settler or nomad or town. These buffs will only last for a certain amount of time, but the timer will pause when actively engaged in combat, so players don't need to feel unnecessarily rushed if they plan on taking the monster down. The nomad who set the tribute will still gain a tribute spell slot if the monsters collect the tribute instead of another player. In terms of groups, nomads can strategize their one protection point with other nomads. Some nomads can protect their fauna and grow resources they need, while other nomads can use their protection spells to build small buildings that are sizable enough to keep resources protected, but not large enough to scare off wild fauna. While this can work on an individual and small-scale level, working together in larger groups can result in larger villages and constructions. This can work if nomads work together using strong tribute spell slots and cast spells to keep wild fauna from stressing due to their larger presence. This would make them less nomadic, but still nature-based. Groups or solo players can mix and match these properties. For example, nomads can attach wagons to their fauna, which extends their protection to their property on a mobile level, at the cost of some mobility. For a less nomadic lifestyle, survivalists can use protection spells to protect a property and tame fauna as regular mounts for mobility. Then they can use the nature around them as is by manually planting and watering surrounding flora instead of using spells. They will not be tied to laws of nature as a partnership with wildlife would, and they can hunt any creature they see fit for their needs by wants or survival. It's really up to players to use the mechanics available however they want. In episode 3, we talked about how players persist while offline in a firefly state, either by floating in the last area the player was in, or at a campfire, or in a mantle. When nomads log off, at their logged off screen, you can see a little area around your fauna, and you can spawn back at any time, same as with following a player or a vehicle. Closed designs will still hide the fireflies like regular vehicle lanterns, and open designs will allow fireflies to be seen if players like that aesthetic better. Just like a private property, a nomad can set their property as private or public with friendlies and bans, so allowed players can log off at their mantle and others can't. This includes options to allow friends to ride your fauna and spell cast with them as well. This way, if some friends want to share a herd or pack, if they are nomads, they can log in and out at the same fauna and potentially remain together and use the same spell slots. The last thing we will talk about is some church mechanics. Note, there will be other church mechanics, but for now, we'll talk about the nomadic-themed ones. Settlers can set up churches, and an invited nomad will need to light the shrine offered to them with a torch, flint, or other fire starter to accept. The church will need to keep the shrine or altar lit for the connection to last. These don't have to be full churches and can just be outdoor altars and shrines as well. The fire will glow brightly when the nomad is online, and less so if they are offline. If the nomad's mantle breaks, meaning the bond with their partner has ended, or if the player deletes the character, the fire will go out completely. Churches can reinvite the nomad through group prayer, and will need to be relit by the nomad after retaming their fauna or finding a new one. In the case that the church members hear a whisper that their prayer has gone unheard, they may need to find a different nomad or groups of nomads for a new connection. If the shrine breaks, someone will need to reconstruct it. Only nomads with active partners can light shrines and churches, or an envoy of a group of nomads blessed by a nomad that has a partner can. If these requirements are not met, the flame will ignite briefly, then fizzle out. 
Any offerings burnt here will add to the Nomad's spell slots as blessing spells. The Nomad will need to be online to receive it and has a limited window to accept or reject it. For groups of Nomads, the first to accept receives the blessing spell. It might be beneficial for a Nomadic group to impose roles for this. Nomads will want to reject offerings that would offend the partner fauna. The nomad can use blessing spells to enter their partnered fauna into settler areas without spooking it if the offering is strong enough. Other herd or pack members still won't be able to go near settled areas. The stronger the fauna is, the more offerings will be required for sustained entry. Churches would do well to strategize the burning of resources to have the needed effect, or else the partnered fauna can go berserk in settled property if they try. When entered successfully or otherwise close enough, nomads can then cast blessing spells on flora and fauna in the settlement or help heal and cure others, or add blessings to other sacrificial offerings. This is useful for farms, fisheries, ranches, mines, players, and cultists. Nomads can bless guided by requests or of their own accord. Nomads can also choose to bless themselves and their fauna to further stack buffs instead of aiding a settlement. It is up to players to decide what is acceptable or not in their agreement, as either can break the church bond at any time. Also, you don't always have to choose between a settler and a nomad. There are also your wanderers or backpackers or even characters who have wagons set as their home base, but we'll discuss all these options in a future video. And there we have it, the building mechanics for settlers and the spellcasting mechanics for nomads. This system potentially can help balance out resource usage from players who are inspired by nature's aesthetics. Settlers will be able to create properties that reflect the aesthetics of the world around them and the history created by them. They will need to maintain resources to upkeep their maintenance and have different strategies to store and showcase items they've collected and crafted in the world. Settlers also have strong defensive buildings that resist monsters. They will also want to seek out stronger resources set by nomads, and in exchange, nomads gain spells to manage their packs, herd, and wilderness in special ways. These systems create a role-playing opportunity due to expectations from either player types and the needs and wants from them both. If nomads are obsessed with nature enough for it to grow wildly, they will need to strategize disease and rot spreading. They will need to be strategic with monster attraction to keep their resources safe and to not upset the balance with nature. If settlers grow, nomads and other wildlife won't approach settlements, and they'll need to find ways to be more self-sustaining through farms, ranches, or traveling farther to find wild resources, or they can create bonds with a local nomad or a group of them to bridge that gap. All of these create role-playing scenarios not seen before in MMORPGs today, and I'm just getting started. In the next episode, we'll talk about monster threats and how monsters are tied to these mechanics. If this video moved you, please leave a like and a comment to help us with the YouTube algorithm. Everything posted on my Patreon is up for free if you want to receive next episode updates. Bookmark it! It's in the description below. Anyways, see you in the next one whenever it's ready.